liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Yeah? You sure you can stay? I think so. <laughs> okay. Maybe they can handle it. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so since he got here, he has been getting constant contact from his business. Yeah. And okay. it's phone right. calls and texts and who knows. Just part of it, man. Just part of part of being a busy person. Yeah. Unfortunately. What what they don't know is he can't go back to work now because he's already had a glass of whiskey. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> can't expect yep. me to work now. Yep, I'm off the clock. I've already had a glass of whiskey. I'm clocking out. <laughs> <laughs> so it was cheap whiskey too, but it was good. But it was still good. Yeah. Which is which is nice. I I don't think that that matters as much to you because no. you don't drink as much as me. Yeah. I um, really don't know. And I don't know that it matters that much to me either, because while this is a, a, a good whiskey at a very good price, yeah. um, there's better whiskeys at higher prices. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can afford them, so. <laughs> yeah, well, for now. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm stocking up to trade when the when the economy collapses. Yeah. Like, well, that you're, we just... you're stocking up ammo, I'm stocking up booze. <laughs> hey, together we're going to be an unstoppable <laughs> team, man. <Yeah. laughs> I figure booze will definitely be tradable. Oh, yeah. I thought, well, ammo will always be valuable, so yeah. we're going to be all right. <laughs> I'm 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 researching is what I'm doing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm wow. researching. I got another um couple of new bottles yeah. so if you're if you're down for it when we're done with the podcast you can you can yeah. try some other stuff too <laughs> maybe i i've got a uh, i've got a rittenhouse replacement oh really yeah i mean it's not actually a replacement because i think rittenhouse is better oh yeah but um but it's uh, a couple dollars cheaper and yeah. comparable it's not yeah. it's not quite as good but yeah. it's comparable but if you couldn't find rittenhouse on the shelf it's yeah. one you'd grab yeah yeah definitely um and uh, it's a Tennessee um, distiller. So, yeah. Anyway, actually, it's probably easier to find Rittenhouse than Riverset. <laughs> but it's good to know that it's out there. Yeah, there's there is another rye option. Yeah, I'm particular about my rye, so, yeah. so I'll be interested to give it a give it a try. All right. Well, we can definitely we we can definitely try that. Yeah. Um, I I don't know where to start really. The Queen like, is dead. Yeah, that's a place to start. <laughs> queen is dead. Yeah. I like it actually happened in very little bit of time yesterday. Like I, I was on France twenty four around lunchtime yesterday, and they were like, "Oh, you know the the Queen's family has been rushed to her, her bedside," and um, and then like I had to go uh, to um, to an appointment, and when I got there. The queen was dead. The queen, yeah, wow. <laughs> it was like less than ten minutes. No, yeah. And uh, so yeah, and um, I really don't care that much. <laughs> well, that's me. And I, I mean, I'm sorry anybody's dead, but like, it's you know, what does she have to complain about? She was a monarch for more than seven decades. She lived to be almost a hundred years old. Like, well, to me, eh. that's to me that's noteworthy. The fact that she was there for so long yeah i, th I mean because i watched so i watched a bunch of news yesterday i'm mm -hmm. hoping to find some interesting things to talk about on the podcast by the and way instead you found this i found this is all i found by the way so i'm full <laughs> of queen knowledge oh, that i good. have absolutely no use for yeah. but but i did find it interesting though that she was there for that long yeah i mean that that in itself was interesting and the thing i found the most interesting was she was apparently the first um first monarch to to have her coronation done on tv oh which yeah makes that's sense. about right yeah. <laughs> when you think about it because yeah like i guess they didn't really do that before then did they yeah it was like the end of world war ii when she was yeah so and they showed some stuff. video from that which i thought was neat i'm into old mm. stuff anyway so yeah. like i thought that was pretty cool um but it's it doesn't affect us here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Like it's not. I was talking to somebody at my appointment yesterday, and I said um, that I, I was saying that I didn't really understand, and she was saying, "Oh, well, she was interested, you know, was, like mm -hmm. the the I don't know why the British monarchy is interesting. I just I don't get it. Yeah. Um, I was like, I th I think that we have enough uh, enough of interest in our own politics to deal with somebody else's. Yeah. And <laughs> and she said something like that 
Um, well, she's disgusted by our politics. Well, so am I. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, well, that, yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. Um, but uh, the Queen's politics don't affect me at all. Right. <laughs> Not one bit. Our politics affects my day-to-day, day-to-day life. Yeah. Um, and the Queen can do whatever the hell she wants over there. I, it doesn't affect me. Well, the whole war, so we don't have to worry about them. Yeah, exactly. And now we're choosing to. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't understand. Um mm. I, it was. I get why the news was so infatuated about it, just because there's a lot to talk about there. The mm-hmm. fact that she was there for so long, and you know, had an interesting, lived an interesting life. Like, yeah. there's a lot to talk about as far as from a news standpoint. And it doesn't have anything to do with anything remotely important. It's a nice, good distraction. Yeah. Um. So all of that I get. Um. But the. People being in, like, I had so many people stop me today talking about the the passing of the queen. And mm-hmm. it's just like, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. I just, I don't. I'm it's, sorry for her family. I guess. I mean, I'm not a big fan of some and of her family. So maybe her country. Well, you know, it doesn't stop me from feeling bad about them losing. I, I get it. You know, like, a family member. But yeah, beyond that, it's just not yeah. relevant to me at all. Exactly. And I was trying to think and earlier. like half of our listeners have turned off. They don't care about the, the queen. queen. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just can't imagine. So um, I just can't imagine caring that much. I was trying to think earlier today, like when after it was brought up to me by so many different people, like what kind of person like passing as far as celebrity or politician that like I would actually care about. And there's really only a handful. Like, and even then, like I would like... Ron Paul, for instance. Yeah. I'd be upset. Yeah. But start preparing yourself for that one too. He's he's no man. No, he's making it. He's living forever, man. He's going to outlive us all. (laughs) Uh, I don't even want to hear it. (laughs) But like I say, I I mean, that would hurt. But yeah. I mean, it still wouldn't be. What about Joe Biden? Start preparing yourself for that one. Wouldn't even care. Uh, (laughs) I don't know. May throw up. That one may get me in the streets. Yeah, <laughs> I the, would care. It is still the president of the United States, so, and yeah. um, it would uh, it would mark the beginning of the Kamala Harris <laughs> which presidency, is, yeah. which is uh, would drive me back to that bottle of alcohol. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, they should all drive you to that bottle of alcohol. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a reason that I, I'm. I'm now seeking out the cheap liquor. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Inflation is, is catching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, so I went to the liquor store not too long ago, and and I went to a, not the ABC, so I knew it was going to be more pricier in mm-hmm. there than what I was used to seeing. But, man, like, I need to go into an ABC and just see where real prices are at because yeah. I was like, dude, this is crazy, the yeah. prices. Yeah. Um, that's something we may talk about at one point, like the advantages and disadvantages of a state-controlled liquor board. Yeah. I I do uh, appreciate that um, the prices are consistent. The prices are consistently low, except for the fact that, uh, it, well, for hard-to-find things, the prices are consistently low. Yeah. For easy-to-find things, the prices are consistently high because of all of our liquor taxes here. Yeah. Um, But it's consistent, and... Like, you know, you're not going to walk into an ABC and see a bottle of Willet Pot Still Reserve listed at $125. Yeah. Right? You, like, you it's going to be... some liquor stores around here, though, that are not ABC. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you will see it consistently listed. At, it used to be 60 probably 65 now. Yeah. Um, well, it used to... Shoot, when I started buying that stuff, it was like... 45 or 50 maybe but it yeah I suddenly know became known i don't know what happened but it yeah well it's good this is what happened well, yeah but it's been around forever and yeah. you know i don't know there was some wave of recognition that that passed well, i paid 50 me. for that bottle quite a few times yeah so um but i think it's probably like 65 now yeah uh I told you they had that one in the Gulf Shores ABC that was listed at 65. Yeah. Um, so if anybody's looking. <laughs> yeah, if you're in the Gulf Shores Orange Beach area, go to the Gulf Shores ABC, ask for a Willet Pot Still Reserve. It may still be on the shelf. They had one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I saw. Um, and if I, I, I almost 
gotten the drove car. to Gulf Shores <laughs> to buy it. But um, I, f- I got some, you know, we're planning a trip sometime soon. I, I, I figure that I, I, I'll have other opportunities to buy it. But if you're like stuck here in Alabama, um, yeah. you may as well go pick that one up. <laughs> yeah, that's a buy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I'm not real concerned about the British politics. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, the, the queen, supposedly the monarchy is really symbolic at this point. Um, there's some conspiracy theory questions about that, of course, yeah. but, um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't understand why why Americans are so interested. That is, that's the thing that I don't get. Yeah, it's just it doesn't interest me at all. Really. Yeah. Um, and there really are some things that are going on here in our own American politics that you should be paying attention to. Um, well, our great president gave a speech the other night. Yeah, let's go, go ahead and play a bit of that. All right. We must be honest with each other and with ourselves. Too much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. Not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know, because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. I don't know, man. I just love being told by somebody that you're, that you're, my opposition is just horrible and you can't some of my opposition is okay, but some of my opposition is just intolerable. Yeah. Like who, who made you determine their, be the determiner of what's okay and what's not? I am the decider. Yeah. You think of that American dad episode. <laughs> anyway. Um, I, yeah. I, one thing that's not normal is, um, a president openly attacking the, his predecessor. Yeah. Uh, that's something that's unusual in this country. It is. Um, now, I, there's some, like, you know, I hate to be just, like, go through and point out contradictions and so forth. But um, he says, you know, not even a majority of Republicans are, you know, these extremist MAGA Republicans. Well, he's, he's but trying then, to define this. He's, he's taken this term MAGA and trying to turn it into something that he can weaponize. Oh, and it's been effective. Oh, I'm sure it has. Um, you know, the pollsters are uh, like the pollsters are saying that this like extreme MAGA and MAGA Republican thing has has taken hold. It's gotten his base fired up. Well, I was going to say um, it'll energize the left. I'm sure. Yeah, it gives them an enemy. But he says, uh, you know, he says it's not even a majority um, of the Republicans. But then at the same time, he says that the party is under the control of these MAGA Republicans and is being directed and intimidated and so forth. So. Like, is it the Republican Party or is it not? Yeah. Well, it, and the truth is, is that it, the the Trump has the party now. Like, it's mm-hmm. it, this the Republican Party is the party of Trump. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got a handful of your Liz Cheney's and people of that ilk mm-hmm. that are that are not part of that, but they are a massive minority at this point. Yeah. Um, um, well, they're they're not certainly not very popular. No, like uh, the people that are the people that have been standing up, standing against Trump and the Republican Party, like Liz Cheney, yeah, are not holding their offices. No, no, no. Um, they have been losing some primaries, and there really should be some kind of of uh, message to people in that. Yeah, like maybe we should may start looking at why it is that these people align with Trump so hard. Yeah. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any kind of analysis of that at all, at least not in mainstream media. I, you know, back to Biden's comments, like, there's some questions that I have. Like, how are these people a threat to the republic? January 6th. Well, you saw what they did. Yes, I did. <laughs> You're right. I, um, you know, back to that again. It, that's just one of those things. Like, the U.S. military is by far the largest in the world. Yeah. By far. Um, the Capitol Police Force 
is one of the largest police forces in the world. Probably rivals some of those militaries. It, I'm sure that it does. I'm um, sure it does too. <laughs> you know, but it, it's uh, you know you're talking about in a in a country with. Um, cities like L.A. and New York and Chicago and, and so forth, where the Capitol Police is one of the largest police forces in the country. Yeah. Um, Miami, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I just want somebody to explain to me in what way the Republic was threatened by a few hundred unarmed people. Yeah. <laughs> like, w- yeah. what scenario do they see where those people were able to stop the the vote and prevent Joe Biden from becoming the president. I, 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 I just I think, don't even understand. I think the argument from the left would be is, well, it sets a precedent for in the future, as far as questioning elections. The problem with that is the is Democrats that they spent the previous four years questioning exactly. the election. Yeah. Like, I mean, you could, if it wasn't for that, you could almost at least sympathize. I mean, I still mm-hmm. wouldn't sympathize, but you could, there would at least be an argument to sympathize with them that, Hey, you know, they, you know, questioning elections, we shouldn't mm-hmm. do that. But you just got through doing that for four years. Yeah. Well, and you know, and even only, if it had only been like um, the the Gore Bush election that there had been a big question about, and you know, there's like really reason to believe that there was definitely some shenanigans in 2004. Now, of course, I would yeah. say that there's shenanigans in every election. Like that's just part yeah. of the course. Um, but uh, you know, the whole um, Russian psyop to <laughs> put Donald Trump in power thing. I don't know. That also, I guess, feeds into this Mar-a-Lago raid as well. Like, oh, you know, there were all those empty uh, classified folders and, and, you know, he uh, he either like destroyed the documents or hid them or, or sold them off to the Russians. Like, that's the kind of thing that you see yeah. out there. Like, OK, if he was going to do any of that, why would he wait till after he was president? Yeah, right. Well, like he could declassify them while he was president. He yeah. could destroy any documents that he wanted, more or less. Yeah. Um, and when he had access to all of the documents, that seems like the time that you would start selling out to the high so, is better, right? right? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. It's just like the whole... It, well, it, I'm it, still amazed at the focus on this man. Well, something that... Talk, speaking about the Mar-a-Lago thing that I, I haven't heard mentioned at all throughout all of this is former presidents still get classified briefings. I uh, bet he doesn't. Well, I bet he doesn't. But traditionally, yes, presidents normally still get these type of briefings. Mm-hmm. So I just it it boggles my and nobody ever even mentions any of that. But but like I know for a fact that that's what traditionally is what's happened. Yeah, because they keep they still need to be kept in the loop because the the current president can refer back to them for advice and things mm-hmm. like that. There's good reason for the the former president to still get those type of briefings. Um. But you're right. I bet this president hasn't gotten any. And I'm curious about that. Like if he has actually still gotten those type of briefings or not. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine I hadn't talked to in a long time last weekend. Yeah. Um, and he is on the left, solidly on the left. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were talking about uh, Trump at one point. And, um, and what it come down, he, he's talking about how, well, you know, the guy's so corrupt and that's why he is disliked and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, the reason he was disliked is because he wasn't part of the club. Yep, exactly. That's why he was disliked. And I, I think that I, I swayed him at least partially yeah. um, to that opinion. He was like, no, you're right. Like he definitely wasn't part of that political elite class. Like yeah. he was on the outside. Well, and I never um, could understand from the <clears> moment <throat> Trump came down the escalator, the left was freaking out over this guy. Yeah. And I never really, like, I mean, I always, when when all of that was going on <laughs> in the heat of 2016, I just, I never understood why they hated him so much because I was like, I mean, this guy's no, uh, your typical New York, like, liberal. Like, yeah, this really. guy shouldn't be this unique evil that y'all have made him out. And yeah. immediately, like, it wasn't even like it mm-hmm. took a while. Yeah, like, he's kind of a doofus. He doesn't really seem to be a threat of any kind, well, except that it exposed so much. Well, and he's and he's anti-establishment, which is he's something. anti-globalist. Yeah, that's really well, and probably that's, the issue. But it, it always bugged me that the the like, America first thing is the threat. Yeah, but it always bugged me that the like the liberals I knew were all so like hung up against this guy. Like I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I get why the. Um, New York Times and like these other establishments don't like him, 
but why don't you like him? Yeah. was always kind of my question. Like, what did he do that made you so angry? Mm-hmm. Um, and they always would have some BS thing, but, yeah. it was, but it was always silly. I'm like, you're smarter than this. Well, I, I, I want to point out in that clip um, that when he says that these MAGA Republicans are a threat to democracy and they're extremists and so forth, like the applause yeah. that you hear in the crowd. Um, I, I also do want to point out, like a lot has been made of about the appearance of this thing. The um, optics, yeah. yeah with, uh, you know, the soldiers standing behind him and the red building and the, all that stuff. Um, Look like something out of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I get it, and I, I don't understand how anybody could not have noticed, but I actually think that this is something that where it was just like it was just unrecognized. Yeah, that it was incompetence on well, the part of the people that set things up. A lot up. of people have made it out to be like this was intentional and this was the mm-hmm. look he wanted to go for. And I'm with you, like I I don't really think that that's the case. Yeah, I think that it was just one of those deals that was just poor planning. Yeah, um, I saw a wider shot of Independence Hall and it was lit up in at least blue and red. Probably Probably white, blue, and red. Yeah. Um, with red in the center. And the and, red is what got focused in on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not like they just had this, you know, ominous red building behind them. <laughs> they they should have what they should have done is they should have done it from some kind of angle where you could get the blue and the red. You know, the, or like, at least put the blue in tight. You know. Yeah. Made it the first color. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Yeah. Something. Um, but it, it did look bad. Oh, it um, looked. And yeah. There, I mean. I, it was, Bad, depending on what you think. Like, I mean, I think it looked honest, but yeah, well, <laughs> given the tone of the speech. <laughs> well, and that's that's probably, you know, like the point to focus on is it, it seems like there's no real definition of these extremist, extremist threats to the republic, except that those that aren't, he can work with. So that's that seems to actually be the definition is that people he can work with are not extremist. Yeah. Um, and threats to democracy and people that he can't work with aren't. So if you, if you go along with what he wants to do, then you're not an extremist. Yeah. And, um, he goes on to say, and I, I want to cut back to, um, his, uh, press secretary, the white house spokes liar, yeah. um, reinforcing that point. And we'll play a little clip for that. But, um, he does go on to say, I didn't bother to clip it, but, um, that the, these MAGA Republicans have no respect for constitution or rule of law. Yeah. And I found that really interesting considering like his most recent big action that they're now, you know, campaigning on was this debt forgiveness. Yeah. <laughs> that shows <laughs> no is... respect for the constitution or rule of law. He does not have the power under the constitution to do this. Yeah. Um, and frankly, but, but this the, is good. So the it's government okay. has no, um, has no authority under the constitution to make loans to for student debt. Yeah. Um, so like the whole thing, I don't know. There's like a, uh, there's a collection of these things. And like the idea that the, the MAGA Republicans are, um, uniquely opposed to the constitution or the rule of law seems, uh, just really absurd. I think a lot of, if you just sp- spoke to like, people on the street who identified as I'm using quotes, MAGA Republicans, mm-hmm. I bet they would make, could make a much better argument that they're the ones who are following more constitutional and believe more in the constitutional than, than he can. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. I, I almost, uh, I almost screenshotted it just so that I could remember what was said. Um, in an article I was reading earlier about like this whole idea of the MAGA, the dangerous MAGA Republicans. Yeah. Um, there was a, a comment underneath that was like, look, I consider myself a MAGA Republican and mostly what I want is to be left alone. Yeah. I want to go to my job. I want to keep as much of my money as I can. I want my kids to be educated in the way that I would like, not, um, you know, brainwashed into some ideology that I disagree with. I want to, uh, you know, enjoy times with my friends and my family and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, well, this is a MAGA Republican. This is somebody that just is, mostly wants to be left alone. It, the, yeah. I mean, you're talking about overwhelmingly these are reasonable people. Yeah. Like it's, and something else I want to just draw a distinct line here. When mm-hmm. he says MAGA Republicans, mm-hmm. he means just like kind of what you were saying. He means everybody that doesn't want to go along with him. Yeah. Um, I well, mean, uh, let's play that uh, Karine Jean-Pierre all right. clip real quick, and then we'll come back to that. All right. All right. Here she goes. 
And again, we see majority of Americans who disagree. And so when you are not with where majority of Americans are, then, you know, that is extreme. That is an extreme way of thinking. Yeah, there it is. She just said it. Yeah. <laughs> like, if, if you're not part of, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially how it comes off, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's um, how I took it. Um, and that's, so even if you're not a MAGA Republican or whatever, don't think that you're going to, or you're a Libertarian or mm-hmm. Green Party or whatever you may be. He's coming after you too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the way this is starting to shape up is it's not just, um, a lot of it's talk right now, but there's a lot of, there's a real push right now. And we've talked about it a ton on this podcast to move towards, uh, domestic terrorism type thing to move the war on terror inwards into this country. Yeah. And like this, this is the type of thing that you got to look out for, man. Yeah. And that's why it's dangerous. Now, uh, my, my note on this, um, what I wrote down to remind me what that clip was about, yeah. um, is KJP illustrates dangers of democracy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, the, the majority rule, yeah. Um, you know, or, or, um, authority by the majority or, you know, however you want to. Well, I mean, that is the reason we're not a democracy. Yeah. And, and it's something to point out to people is that like, this is why, um, our founding fathers worked so hard to prevent democracy. It wasn't just because they were a bunch of elitist a-holes that, um, didn't trust normal people to, to make decisions. It's that mobs, mob rule is dangerous. Mobs are dangerous. Absolutely. And um, they wanted to make sure that uh, that 51 percent of the of the public in the U.S. couldn't oppress the other 49 percent. Yeah, exactly. It was it was as much as anything an attempt to um, prevent any majority from oppressing any other group. Yeah. Now there's debate to be had about how effective it's been. Yeah. Uh, and of course, when they made it, even. You know, there, there was, was slavery. Yeah, it's not like we did yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, so, but so they did. It's not perfect. Yeah. I mean, it, also, what people don't understand is that they wrote it into the Constitution that there was uh, to be a moratorium on the slave trade um, yeah. in 20 years. Uh, they were trying to they, they couldn't sign a document. They couldn't get an agreement without making some concessions to slave states. Yeah. And um, they created they wrote into the document a moratorium on the slave trade, which they thought would end slavery. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, and there were, I don't want to go down this road right now. I was going like, to say, this, a, this is a rabbit hole. Yeah. yeah. There were too many things. There, Founding fathers with slaves, there were often, um, let me, there were a bunch of laws that prevented them from freeing slaves at the time. Yeah. Like, and one of the big ones in Virginia, where a lot of these people were from, was that if you had any public debts... Um, that you couldn't free your slaves because slaves were property. Yeah, yeah. Right? So they could be used to settle debts. Yeah. Um, so if you were in debt, you couldn't give all your slaves away. Yeah. <laughs> or let them go or whatever. Like that was... That was just a system that we yeah. had. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the the thing that I find really interesting about this is that um, this is the party, of course, that celebrates diversity to such a high level. The diversity is so important. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Yeah. And you've got the this um, Haitian black female lesbian delivering this message that if you're not in the majority, you're an extremist. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but the their whole idea of diversity is based completely on superficial traits that they would also tell you don't matter. Yeah. Like it doesn't tell you anything about a person. Like it doesn't, you know, it shouldn't affect your opinion of somebody, whether the, what their race is or their gender or their sexual preferences or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, but at the same time, those, those differences are, are uh, to be treasured in some way, but, but you require some kind of unity of thought or yeah. unity of ideology. Yeah. Like any deviation from my ideology is a threat. 
We don't celebrate diversity of opinion in any way. I was fixed to say diversity of opinion is important too. Mm -hmm. um, that's in fact, I would say that's more important than anything. Yeah, like, especially if you consider yourself a progressive. How how the hell yeah. do you expect to progress right. if everybody? Is believes the same thing. If there's no step. challenge to the status quo. Well, and it's like, not even... What happens when you achieve what you want as a progressive and you have no diversity of opinion? If you get all of these these ideological changes that you want, now you're what, static? Yeah. Like, you can't challenge the status quo once you, you've achieved your particular goals? I don't know. It just... Yeah. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, what you were talking about earlier is is definitely something to... Um, pay attention to there, which is the expansion of the terrorist label that, you know, started off as uh, people, um, you know, uh, using violence to achieve political goals against the U.S. overseas. Mm -hmm. Then it was people doing the same thing at home. And then it was anybody anti-government. Like we could we could even play that John Brennan clip. Uh, again, but we're not going to because yeah. those of you that have been around a while, you've heard it plenty of times where anybody who's anti-government is a, is a potentially a terrorist extremist, a yeah. uh, you know, a domestic extremist. What was the phrase that they were using for a while? Um, whatever. Anyway, uh, and then it was like, you know, people that were opposed to the wars um, were terrorists. And then it was um, people that were opposed to public schooling inculcating their kids with ideologies that they didn't agree with. Those are terrorists now. Yeah. Um, and then, and so what's the next thing? If you're not in the majority, you're a terrorist? I mean, that's what the speech lays out. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I don't want to be alarmist about it. I think that it's been overinterpreted in that way. But it is, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Oh, I, um, absolutely. And there there does seem to be... I, I think that this is... I don't think that this is that strong a maneuver. I, I think that this is really just a political maneuver to, well, to energize the Democratic base. It is, but it's a dangerous one. And that, that's the point I'd like to make is, mm -hmm. is that this is all just political posturing. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, they, they don't have anything really other than Roe v. Wade to run on in these midterms and they need something. They need to rally their base somehow. And they, and they're kind of desperate because a lot of these races, just like what you were saying earlier, the moderate, moderate Republicans lost their primaries. So if there's a red wave, it's going to be a Trump red wave yeah, that's and right. that's something for them to be concerned about mm -hmm. um and that i think that's the reason you're seeing them act because this is a to me at least an act of desperate it's just a desperate act yeah um so that's that's kind of where we're at but it's mm -hmm. but it's a dangerous play because of kind of the implicate some of the implications we've laid out here yeah well and and to be fair on the other side too he did say something i don't remember if it was in this speech or the one that he gave like you know, less than a week earlier, um, where he said, you know, what are you, you going to stand against the U S government? Well, you can't do that with F 15s and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> now I, I would also point out that, um, uh, Iraqis and Afghanis and Vietnamese and plenty of others have proven that that's not true. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, they have. <laughs> Still but, not something we want to do, though. <laughs> yeah, but it is interesting to have the president like openly declare that if you're a dissident against the U.S. government, you may have to face the U.S. military. Yeah, right. Like as an American citizen. Yeah. Like that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's not the first time he's done that either. No, he's done it a few times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know. It's it's certainly something to be concerned about. I I do think that it. I don't know. It stands out to me that as all these complaints about how terrible Trump is and how, you know, I don't know what, what would be the, the word, but anyway, how mean he is to everybody and so on and so forth. Like yeah. when he was really lashing out yeah. in his speeches and so forth, um, it was almost exclusively against the media. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, not to try to defend Trump because I mean, you know, we, <laughs> quit making me defend this man. But yeah. <laughs> but but you're right though. Like when and he was, it was always almost in a way to like try to bring everybody in. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't really, I didn't feel like like he attacked politicians. I don't know about that, but okay, I, 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 I don't know. I'll, I listen, felt, I'll hear you out. Go I ahead. felt like he was trying. There was there was always an effort to bring everybody kind of under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, at least as but. 
with this, it's it's strictly divisive, and it it wants to use the arm of government is what mm-hmm. kind of worries me with yeah. this type of thing. Um, well, I don't know. I, I I don't understand the um, the Democrat Party with their basket of deplorables or their crazy MAGA Republicans or the whatever like alienating people that don't vote for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because yeah, as as bad as Trump was and uh, like how you can interpret some of the things he said and certainly like I I think frankly his just like rudeness to yeah. politicians on stage with him and things like that I thought that was incredibly entertaining. Oh yeah. Um but he wasn't attacking Democrat voters that yeah. I recall. That's and that's that's the point I'm trying to make is that there was he he didn't attack the people per se. Yeah. And this this is a direct attack on the voters and the people um, that don't agree with him. <laughs> yeah. You know. So. Well, um another example I suppose of uh, a government overstepping its bounds um is the whole vaccine mandates and and all that stuff. And I so I've been thinking about that in terms of again talking to my friend over the weekend and um we share a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, common ground in terms of policy. Like, yeah. um, he's, uh, strongly anti-war against the, the American empire, uh, like me. So he's a real um, Democrat then. I don't, he wouldn't even call himself a Democrat. Yeah. Um, well, but leftist is what he's, leftist. he's okay. like, it, it was a, it was a lot of Marxist ideology. Maybe, maybe a but, good, well, he's a good lefty then. How about that? Sure. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, but when we were, as we were discussing specific policies and so forth, um, the the biggest difference that I found is that he, and I, I you know, this is my perspective on this, this are these sets of arguments, I suppose, um, with leftists, is that he wouldn't take that last step of like who's actually doing the thing that is the bad part that he doesn't like. Yeah. Um. So he would blame the capitalists, blame the corporations, but but never blame the government. Yeah. And my thing was that these corporations have absolutely no power without government backing. Exactly. Um, and so I, I thought that I, that we could talk about this a little bit in terms of the, the vaccines and the big pharma issues. Um, especially now as increasingly studies are showing that the completely safe 90 plus percent efficacy uh, vaccines um I gotta choose my words carefully here. Uh, <laughs> Don't get the podcast taken down. I know. Don't get the podcast taken down. <laughs> can be dangerous to certain people. Yeah. Is that? I mean, that's, do you think I that's think, okay? I think you think that's loose with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, at the very least, there is a real risk reward assessment or calculation for people to make before they decide to get the vaccine. Yeah. Um. Which is amazing because six months a year ago there w- it was oh everybody has to get it you're yeah you're right. you're a horrible person if you don't get this and and during this time of course there's been huge profits for these pharma companies oh yeah um, now you may not be paying for the vaccine directly but you're paying for the vaccine like government bought all, all these vaccines um, yep. at cost or <laughs> well not at cost but like at the the MSRP, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, they paid for the research and the whole nine yards, right? I mean, not, that was Operation not for all of it, but yeah. Warp Speed. I thought they were funding all of that. Um, no, there was. Uh, I think Moderna um, didn't take one of the two. One of the two big ones, Moderna or Pfizer, didn't take uh, government money for the research. Okay. Um, yeah. But it, they certainly taken their money to actually sell the vaccines. Yeah. Um, and uh, and produce them because weren't they producing vaccines before they knew if they were even going to be effective so they could have them out quicker? Like I distinctly well, remember that. Like I, I mean, I would say that the yeah for like a year and a half, right? Yeah. <laughs> Until we discovered that they weren't actually as effective or well, yeah, no, I but mean, I'm talking about before they even released them to the public. I'm sure that that's true. Um, 
Because I, don't know, I, it's I, hard dis- to say. I distinctly remember this thing Trump talking about it, where it was we're gonna we're we're producing the vaccines, and some of these vaccines aren't going to be the right one. But mm. once once we find the right one, it'll already be produced. We're going to get it straight to the public immediately. Like I remember that. Okay, right? I don't remember that now, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Um. Now, like his perspective on this would be uh, that the drive for profit. Um, incentivize these companies to to lie to the consumers about the effectiveness and the safety and so forth so that they could sell more of their product. Yeah. Right? Um, and and my question as a, as a free marketeer yeah. um, would be, would this profit have really, would this profit even be realized in a, in a real free market system? Yeah. Um, you know, could they have generated this kind of profit without the protection and support of the government. Uh, and the reason I ask this is because if you lie to your consumers yeah. uh, about your product in a free market, like you may sell a bunch initially. Yeah. But but then you ruin the company whenever it falls flat. Yeah. It, um, you, you lose public confidence and people don't buy your products anymore if it turns out not to be true. And yeah. secondly, if you don't have those liability shields that government offered... Yeah. Um, then all of these uh, vaccine injuries You're would liable result, for. yeah, yeah, would result in liability and some kind of lawsuit and some kind of payout. Yep. Um, not all of them, I guess, but but enough you know, of anything them. that could be uh, reasonably um, demonstrated. Yeah. You know, um, and you also wouldn't have. Uh, there were a lot of people that got the vaccines that didn't want to get the vaccines, but because they had their job, their livelihoods threatened. Exactly. Right? Like if you have, if you had a government job and remember government employees, um, what was it like? Uh, oh, I had the numbers a while back. Well, uh, I can't remember what it is now. Oh yeah. man, that's terrible. Um, it's, it ended up being like 3% of the American workforce though worked for the government. Yeah. Yeah. It was something <laughs> absurd. I, rem- I don't remember <laughs> now, but it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I and, remember saying at the time, well, that's a problem in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it was like, uh, it was like 10 million people or, oh, I don't remember. No, 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 no I don't remember. Doesn't matter. Point is that a yeah. lot of people work for the government Yeah. either directly and even more um, work indirectly, indirectly for yeah. the government. Um, so there were a lot of people that were forced to get the vaccines to maintain their jobs. Um, the, uh, the various government agencies that were putting out, Requirements. There was, of course, the um, over a hundred employees. Well, in uh, and- a private business requirement um, that was immediately challenged, but it was well, enough to get people to do it. Yeah. Well, it was enough to scare people into doing it. And I would just like to say, if it wasn't for Trump's Supreme Court, mm-hmm. that we that that would be the law of the land right now. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, that's the only thing that stopped that from being the law of land was the Supreme Court, and mm-hmm. it was justices that Trump put there that did it, like it or not. Yeah, that's that's the reality. Well, a lot of people don't like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, it is the reality, though. Yeah. I want to kind of flip back a few pages of my notes and see if I can find that number of people working that's for gonna the U.S. Bug government. You, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I'm gonna look it up immediately after we get off the podcast. Um, cause those are the kind of statistics that usually stick because they make a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, there would be, there would have been a lot different. Um, uh, you know, this would have worked out a lot differently. A lot fewer people would have gotten the vaccine. I suspect, um, the, they, without that many purchases, obviously their profits wouldn't be so high without the liability protections. They would have lost a bunch of that money in, in court cases, um, or liability cases of various kinds, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, uh, all of this is the reason that in a truly free market, monopolies just don't work. Yeah. You never get you never get that takeover of the market mm-hmm. because there's always somebody there to undercut you. Yeah, and and to do a better job. Well, um, and that kind of leads into our next topic. Uh, if you're ready to switch, sure, I'm um, ready when you are. And we probably should because we're. Like 45 minutes in. All right. All right. So um, let me actually start this one off by playing this clip from Ursula von der Leyen. Okay. Um, Now, this is the the supreme leader of the EU. Queen Ursula. (laughs) Right. Uh, (laughs) I actually did pull this clip from No Agenda. I heard it today, and I was like, oh, man, got to talk about this. This is is a a perfect opportunity to discuss some 
some economics that few people consider. I guess. Uh-huh. All right. I'm excited. Um, so here she is. All right. The second measure. We will propose a cap on the revenues of companies that are producing electricity with low costs. The low carbon energy sources are making in these times, because they have low costs, but they are high prices on the market, enormous revenues. Revenues they never calculated with, revenues they never dreamt of, and revenues they cannot reinvest as far. These revenues do not reflect their production costs. So it is now time for the consumers to benefit from the low costs of low carbon sources, like for example the renewables. We will propose to rechannel these unexpected profits. I love it, man. Unexpected profits. Like, yeah. do, oh, you didn't mean to make these profits, so you should just give them back to the consumer. Right. Like that's that's what I hear, that's what I just heard right there. Well, that that, <laughs> that seems to be what's happening, <laughs> or what the proposal is anyway. Yeah. Um, but I did want to talk about the uh, the economic side of this, which is uh, like at the core of this is this Marxist idea um, of the uh, the uh, cost of goods should be the production cost. Yeah. Um, it's the labor cost of goods theory, right? Okay. So um, essentially it's the, the, the cost of the good uh, should be um, the cost of the labor to produce it, materials, etc. Yeah. And essentially anything more than that is the entrepreneur exploiting the workers and the consumers. Yeah. For profit, for, for pro- their own profit. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not accurate. Like... Um, the cost of a good isn't just like the amount of production that goes into it. Uh, actually, I kind of had this argument with my friend this weekend too, because he's on, he's believes this as well, that the, um, that the businessman is really just stealing labor from his workers, uh, to his own profit. Now, um, one of the libertarian responses to that, or the Austrian, uh, economic, economics responses to that is that, um, the entrepreneur, the business owner is paying the workers up front for the goods that they produce before they've been sold. And so, um, since he is essentially providing a loan to them that his profit can be considered interest yeah. on his loan to them for giving them the money for the good that they produce before the good is sold. Yeah. All right. But that's neither here nor there, really. I just wanted to but that, throw but that. But that's out kind there. of the mechanics of how business works. Yeah, the 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 business like nobody appreciates the risk the business owner takes, yeah. and the money that they put up front, and that um, until real profits are realized, uh, everybody else gets paid first. Yeah, the risk that they're putting on the line. Yeah. Um, now he would say, "Well, you know, Bezos had rich parents." That, I don't know. Anyway, that's. Let's stay away from that. Yeah. For now. Um, the uh, the thing that's not included, like this, is basing um, profit purely on uh, an idea of uh, of accounting profit, essentially. Yeah. Um, cost of uh, production, um, revenue minus cost of production. Yeah. All right, and so that's profit. But. Um, Another aspect of it that that is often not considered by people, like essentially only economists look at this. <laughs> yeah, um, this is another one of those uh, broken window uh, issues. This is the yeah. the unseen. Yeah. Um, is that you have to also consider the opportunity cost to the entrepreneur uh, to do this thing instead of something else. Yeah. yeah. Right. What so, makes me want to get into this industry? Right. So if you can produce solar energy um, for two hundred dollars and you can sell it for two oh five. Yeah. Um, and you realize, you know, $5 in, in, in profit off of that. Notice she said revenue, not profit, by the way. But <laughs> yeah. um, you realize $5 in profit off of that. If given the same amount of time, you could build an umbrella that cost you $10 in goods and you could sell for 20 Yeah. then right. you're better off building the umbrella. Man, I'm an umbrella salesman all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> right? um, because the other things that you can, if you can earn more doing more profit, doing other things with your with the same amount of time, like all else being equal, that's what you're going to choose to do. Yeah. So uh, what she is 
what she's doing here by price fixing. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's what this is. Make <laughs> yeah. no mistake about it. Um, what she's doing here by price fixing, uh, it's it's going to drive producers out of the market. Yep. Like yeah. they can't realize the kind of profits that they were realizing. Also, I have some questions about her input stuff. Like yeah. um, the the reason that uh, that renewable sources, solar energy, wind energy, et cetera, um, costs more than um, non-renewable sources is not because it's cheaper to produce. <laughs> like yeah. uh, she did say something earlier in the speech about um, essentially that wind and sun were free. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I, but actually producing it into electricity is another process like it, but it does seem to be some idea that because wind and sun are free to everybody that obviously this energy costs little it's, to produce. It has to be cheaper. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, whatever. I don't know if that's actually what she's basing on, but that's kind of what it sounded like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we know that if, um, if renewable energy was actually cheaper to produce, they could outcompete the, the carbon sources. Yeah. And then we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. a- actions speak louder, right? I yeah. guess. Um, but anyway, if, uh, if through this price fixing, um, she reduces profits, then other people, all else being equal, people will have better opportunities to to earn more profit doing other things. The yeah. opportunity cost calculation changes. Exactly. Um, and so producers will leave this market to go do other things with their time and money that will be more profitable. Exactly. All right. So if you drive producers out of the market through this price fixing, then you decrease the supply of the good that you're trying to actually create more of. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, of course, if supply goes down, all else being equal again, demand remains the same, then the price should go up. Yeah. Now, this is where profit incentive matters because if it were left to a free market, when that price goes up and people can generate more profit doing this thing, it draws people into the industry. Yeah. And so you increase your supply. Yeah, and brings down the price. And eventually you reach some kind of equilibrium, right? Yeah. But um, and and actually in a free market, uh, the the um, cost of goods does tend to trend towards the cost of production. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody's competing in a free market, and so you know if you're you competing to, for you buyers, you have to sell it there to be competitive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you have now removed this incentive to bring new entrepreneurs. Uh, into the market. Um, and this is the part that people don't seem to see about the ideas of socialism or, or communism um, is that you have a product that you need. You don't have enough people producing it. Yeah. So what do you do? You have to force some people to produce it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is why it always ends in starvation and genocide. Well, I was fixing to say, yeah, starvation will ensue at some point because yeah. nobody wants to produce the food or nobody's capable yeah. because it's not profitable. <laughs> and, uh, of course, in the, um, you know, the, the real end of all this is that uh, you end up with an authoritarian state. And the, the, the real, I guess, inherent problem is that there's no leadership group yeah. that can foresee all the needs in the future to uh, properly... Um, allocate resources uh, to make the economy work. Yeah. Um, the only way that happens is through the actions of the free market with everybody acting in their own self-interest. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's some misses and maybe things don't happen as quickly as you can, but it's a self-correcting system. Yeah. And it doesn't require anybody to know anything except for what they are doing. Exactly. It's, yeah. Uh, it just makes sense to me. I don't know. <laughs> well... Um, I think you're in a minority. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's all I really have to say about that. Like I said, I, I haven't really gotten to look into this. I just heard it today. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I pulled the clip because I, that particular that piece stood out. Yeah. Stood yeah. out to me. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was a good opportunity to try and illustrate, uh, an aspect of economics that I don't think is discussed very often. Yeah. Um, it's that, that there are more things to consider when going into a business besides just the revenue generated from that business. Yeah. You got to 
also assess the revenue generated from alternatives that you could be doing. Yeah. And that that affects your choices in the end. Absolutely. And it only, yeah. like, if you think of it from a first person perspective, yeah. like, of course, you're going to do the thing that does the best for you. Yeah. As long as everybody <laughs> does that. Yeah. yeah. And as long as everybody does that, actually, things work out fine. Yeah. Exactly. And And this is something that, you know, this is one of those fundamental differences that probably me and my friend will never come together on. Yeah. Um, is the is just the idea that the market represents like the most extreme cooperation. Yeah. A and that in order to succeed in a free market without government interference, you have to provide for others. Well, like the only way that you generate profit is by giving people what they want. It forces a voluntary cooperation mm -hmm. for people who may would otherwise. <laughs> That's a weird sentence. It forces a voluntary cooperation. Well, it does <laughs> to people that ordinarily wouldn't cooperate generally. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it. it I would say it facilitates. Facilitates. That's fair. Um, but people that normally of different races and religions and all of these things and mm -hmm. political beliefs and whatever um, all kind of come together because. Because it's that mutual stuff, benefit. Yeah, because none of that stuff matters because it's not. It doesn't. It it doesn't apply to what they're trying. The goal they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it it's it's a I don't know. It just seems like that's it's such a no brainer to me. Yeah, I just don't understand why it's so hard for people to understand. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the um, there's no business that can force you to do anything without government support. Yeah, like you are not going to buy anything from anybody other than voluntarily unless the government makes you yeah. because the the business doesn't have the power to to coerce you into buying their product yeah. only the government does only the government can force vaccines only the government can force you to buy insurance like yeah. the insurance companies may want to be able to do that but they can't and so in a system where the government has the power to to do these kind of things yeah. um, then what you've really done is you've incentivized these companies to lobby yeah to get legislation in their favor. To get and that that's what's happened here. Yeah, to get that government power. Mm -hmm. um, and we really in this country need people to be more fe fearful of government. Like mm -hmm. we're not scared of government enough. Yeah. Um, and I think that's dangerous. And kind of um, going back to the Biden speech, um, like we should be concerned about government openly telling us these type of things. Yeah. I mean, like we really should be. And, and it makes me think back to all the documentaries and stuff I've watched over the years about the Nazis and the fascists. And it, anytime I watch those, I'm always amazed that just people would rally and, and come together in such a way to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and you have to kind of wonder, and I, I don't want to overreact about what the speech or the time we're living in, mm -hmm. but it, is, it does make me wonder, like, are we heading for something like that? Something, you know, I, I don't know. And I don't know what that would look like, but it just, it's, it's something to keep an eye on. The real question is whether Biden will be held accountable if uh, a bunch of Democrats beat up people in MAGA hats. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or put nooses around their neck in the cold in the and cold. send them home. Yeah. Anyway. Um, it's, it's. Strange times we're living in. Mm, truly. It, it really is. He was um, he was going to be the great unifier, remember? Well, and that's that's what's. I mean, I, we all knew better than that, obviously. <laughs> but but it is crazy that like that was like the shtick for him. Like he was going to bring everybody together. He's done it before. Like that was kind of the pitch. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Strange, strange times. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The fear of government is definitely something that is lacking here. Um, you and, know. and you look throughout history, like when bad stuff has happened, it wasn't corporations that did that. Generally, I mean, it's government. I mean, specific bad I'm things to, happening, like, you know, genocide. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm not that good of a history buff. Maybe there are co- corporations know, that no, have committed genocide. I, I don't think so. I, there's been, at least not, yeah. I mean, I, there's probably been like poisoning a lake and well, yeah. killing I, residents around it. And I'm not saying corporations like aren't capable of bad stuff, and they mm-hmm. should be held accountable when they do. Yeah. And there's mechanisms in the market, and honestly, sometimes I think otherwise, yeah. um, to hold accountable for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But the the overall the government is what you should be scared of yeah well and that's the because big they're accountable that, to nobody exactly that's the big difference to to note is that um, absent government protection corporations are held to account Absolutely. they're held liable for the damages that they cause yeah um, governments never are never yeah if a government screws up and poisons a lake guess what that government's going to get. More money because, well, we got to make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah, right. And how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? The answer is always the same. Uh, yeah. Watch the news one day. Uh, well, we need more funding. If we had more funding, we wouldn't have dumped all that poison into the lake. Yeah. Well, because your relationship with any corporation is voluntary, your relationship with the government is not. Exactly. Exactly. So. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, yeah, on that note, we... Uh, we, we've been missing Thursday, but we've been getting the podcast out every week. Absolutely. We're, we're doing really well Friday's this year. Friday's a good day to get one out, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, hey, you know, if we had done it last night, I wouldn't have gotten a chance to hear that Ursula von der Leyen, von der Leyen, von der Leyen yeah. um, clip and get that in there, too. So well, there you um, go. we would have been 20 minutes shorter. Probably. <laughs> I doubt it. But. <laughs> no, I doubt it, too. Um, so uh, we, um, you know, we plan to be back again next week. And uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. Uh, Like and share, comment, subscribe, um, critique. Five-star reviews are always welcome. So are the rest of them, but particularly five-star reviews. Absolutely. Um, Like the thumbs up on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Those seem to matter somehow in a weird way. Uh, Tell your friends. Uh, We're going to keep doing this as long as you guys are listening. And um, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later.